Dear guests, a very warm welcome on behalf of the Europe Forum Lucerne to today's event. What is it about? The Europe Forum Lucerne is committed to a strong Switzerland and a strong Europe. Every year, our community works on a topic and derives implication for companies, for Switzerland and for Europe. This year's topic is the emergence of China. In this context, it is our intention not to treat sustainability as an isolated item, but to systematically integrate it into our activities all year long. It is therefore a great, a great pleasure for us to launch a joint event series together with our platinum partner EY and the Green Business Switzerland initiative under the title, Why Will Green Be the New Blueprint for Success? We have joined forces to tackle some of the most pressi pressing sustainability issues of our time, to be inspired, to learn, and to make a positive and lasting impact for us all. Today's event is entitled, How can you react to the evolving sustainability agendas in Europe and Asia? And I am pleased to now hand over to our moderator, Mr. Ben Teufel, leader EY Carbon and sector leader energy and resources, EY. Ben, the floor is yours. Dear ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this um, evening's event, hybrid event on sustainability. My name is Benjamin Teufel and I am responsible for our end-to-end -end decarbonization solution at EY that we call EY Carbon. Sustainability most likely is the most pressing and the most important challenge of today's world that we need to solve. Looking at some of the facts, we still produce a lot more food than we actually consume. And yet, the produced food is not distributed equally among the global population. There's still many children who are forced into labor work. Many raw materials do not end up in a recycling, but still land in a trash can at the end of the day. There's one billion people globally that still do not have access to electricity, and there's still way too much carbon that we emit on an annual basis, mainly stemming from the power generation sector, the transportation sector, and also from industrial applications. But there's also a positive angle how you could look at it, because it is a man-made challenge. And if we cost it, then maybe we can also solve it. We see more and more countries being committed to emission reduction targets, mostly for most of the countries it's 2050 by when they want to become climate neutral. We see more and more companies also going the same way. A lot more companies have more ambitious targets than the countries themselves by when they want to actually be climate neutral. But in order to become climate neutral, you also depend on others to be able to achieve the own targets that you set yourself. And I think we'll also touch upon that in the discussion later on. More and more companies also realize that turning the business model into a more sustainable business model has a positive effect, at least that you can protect the value of your company. In the best case, you can even create new value, value for your clients, for the employees, for society, which includes the planet, and also for investors and shareholders. Today, we'll discuss some of those challenges and share experiences with three distinct companies. Today, we have with us a representative from Syngenta, a leading, globally leading agri-tech company being engaged in protecting crops and improving seeds. We have someone from the Mediterranean Shipping Company, also known as MSC. They do not only do cruises, they, are, they own 600 vessels. They are the second largest container shipper in the world. They have 10,000 trucks. They manage more than 50 terminals and are the largest private railway operator in Europe. And then, as, as a third company, we do have a representative from Tetra Pak, which is the globally leading food processing and packaging company. Before we dive into the panel discussion in a couple of minutes, I would like to hand over to Markus Pfanner, who is the Vice President of Sustainability of Tetra Pak. And he will give us in an introductory keynote speech 
a little insights in how Tetra Park is actually tackling the sustainability agenda, what they're doing, where their challenges are, and where their targets and ambitions lie going forward. And with that, I would like to hand over to you, Marcus. Please, the floor is yours. Yeah, thanks, Benjamin. And uh, hello, welcome, everybody. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here with you from Lausanne and uh, tell you more about the story of Tetra Pak and also the journey we are on towards, the, um, towards leading the sustainability transformation. As we say, it's a big journey that we are on and I will tell you why we are on this journey, what we have done and also what are our priorities going forward. I think uh, hopefully all of you have a good relation to what Tetra Pak is when you have your milk or juice daily from your carton, hopefully. But, um, you know, as Benjamin said, we are a world leading uh, processing and packaging company, carton packaging company. Now, having said that, if my clicker works, no? Yeah, here we go. So having said that, I want to go a little bit back in time. And this uh, is uh, our founder, Ruben Rousing, that you can see here to the left uh, already some time ago. And I'm showing this picture because I think sustainability is with us since the beginning in 1951. You see here uh, one of our first uh, prototypes of, of a filling machine. I mean, equipment today looks very much different, but uh, those uh, were very important days. When our vision was born, uh, we commit to making food safe and available everywhere, a strong purpose uh, we are all driving. But having said that, you also see here um, a famous statement that he made, uh, a package should save more than it costs. This uh, stayed with us over the last decades and is really driving our, our sustainability DNA because also, of course, uh, on one side, food packaging has a value. It provides safe food to people, but on the other side as well, it costs something, right? Resources that we take as an example. So I'm saying this really to, to, to emphasize that sustainability has been with us, but of course, the context is changing over the last decades, right? With the great acceleration happening on one side, the planetary boundaries, that we are uh, uh, approaching and partially uh, uh, exceeding as a society. And also, I think COVID-19 has displayed certain fragilities in the food system that we as a, as a company really think we can help. So in that sense, I think our vision uh, is stronger than ever, but sustainability also we put really at the core of our business. Now, having said that, a few figures for you as well, so you can relate to Tetra Pak in a better way. We have uh, more than 25,000 uh, committed employees that help our customers make food sa safe and available across the world in more than 160 countries. And in 2020, you can see here that we have uh, sold more than 180 billion packages and that created a 10.8 billion net sales, euro net sales. So this is the company a little bit in, in figures. And you see as well that we have a huge installed base with our customers uh, around the world with more than 110 thousand units in operation, increasing uh, every year. Now, going back to our vision, we want to uh, do business also in a way that uh, is linked to our brand promise, protects what's good. It's a strong promise. It's put on every package uh, stamp where we stand behind this, more than 600 million packages a day. And uh, we commit to protecting people, um, protecting uh, food and also doing that while protecting the planet. And of course, this is also contributing to the UN Sustainable Development Goals that you can uh, see here linked to our, our pillars. Now, having said that, we have the planet side, which is, is increasingly important, and we will talk more about uh, today as well. Uh, and here, we very much uh, want to look at it in a systematic way, where we look at climate, circularity, and biodiversity that need to balance each other, and they're all inter interlinked. So we need to really find low carbon circular solutions um, and as well work a lot on our sourcing across the full value chain and in partnership with a lot of other companies across the value chain. Now, having said that, I'll show you a little video that also illustrates the journey we are on in a good way. Uh, four minutes for you. By 2050, the global population is predicted to reach 9.1 billion. That's one third more mouths to feed, which will require 70% more food. Packaging plays an important role in keeping food safe, nutritious and available for a growing number of people around the world. But it can also cause problems for our planet. 
greenhouse gas emissions, depletion of fossil-based resources, waste in landfills, nature and waterways. Plastic production reached 359 million metric tons in 2018. Recycling is part of the solution, but the world cannot rely on recycling alone. Despite high pressure and growing industry initiatives, only 9% of total plastic is recycled today. Although plastic can protect food products, it's usually made from fossil-based materials, putting pressure on finite resources and climate change. What about aluminium? Like plastic, it has protective attributes, but it requires strip mining, which has a high carbon footprint. What if there were a better alternative? Studies support that compared to plastic, glass and metal, our carton packages have a lower carbon footprint across the life cycle. Less than half the footprint of a plastic bottle for ambient dairy products. Two to three times lower footprint than a plastic bottle for chilled dairy products. And ten times lower footprint than a glass bottle for chilled dairy products. That's because our carton packages are made of about 70% paperboard, which comes from trees, and trees regenerate, taking up CO2 as they grow. However, our carton packages also contain thin layers of plastic and aluminium, which play a key role in securing food safety. So how can we create the ideal sustainable food package that both protects the planet and secures food safety and availability? To do so successfully, we believe we need to face five main challenges. We need to use renewable or recycled materials so we don't drain our planet's resources and source these in a way that protects biodiversity. We need to pursue carbon neutral production and distribution of packaging to reduce the negative impact on climate. We must continue to make safe and convenient packages, ensuring we reduce food waste and that people everywhere have access to quality food. We must ensure all packaging is fully recyclable and build an integrated recycling system that keeps materials in use. And we need to maximize the use of materials with the lowest impact on nature because waste systems are not optimal and not all materials can be infinitely recycled. Made mostly of renewable materials, paper-based carton packages have the full potential to address these challenges and protect nature from the beginning of the package's life cycle all the way to the end. At Tetra Pak, we're taking the lead on this journey towards the ideal sustainable food package. Today, 100% of Tetra Pak carton packages are certified by the FSC, and the sugarcane-based plastic is Bon Sucre certified, meaning we only source materials responsibly contributing to the protection of biodiversity and supporting local people. We're committed to reaching net zero greenhouse gas emissions in our own operations and to using 100% renewable electricity by 2030, with the ambition to achieve net zero greenhouse gas emissions for the entire value chain by 2050. We continuously develop sustainable food packages that never compromise food safety and contribute to reducing food waste. We're working to reduce the use of aluminium and plastic while increasing the share of paper-based content in our packages. But we won't stop there. Our aim is to create cartons made fully of responsibly sourced renewable or recycled materials that are fully recyclable and carbon neutral. It's all part of our journey to deliver the world's most sustainable food package. We believe that with the support of our customers, collaborators and partners, we can make a difference. Go nature, go carton. Tetra Pak protects what's good. Yeah, good. I think I hope you have enjoyed the little movie and uh, it displays that we really believe that uh, high performance, sustainable food processing and packaging can make a positive difference. And that is what we really are working all towards. And having said that, we also made sustainability uh, a key integrated part of our business strategy, our strategy 2030, as we call it, that leads our company over the next decade. We believe that sustainability can drive customer value, consumer value, and also business growth. And we have two goals that you see here, basically. First one, lead with low carbon circular economy solutions. A lot of investment, innovation going into our solutions. And secondly, enhance sustainability across the value chain, where we have programs in place on climate, on circularity, recycling, a lot of efforts, biodiversity and sourcing, etc. So really working across the full value chain to make things happen and uh, enable a better future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marcus.
for those for those outlines and we'll come back onto some of the some of the points later on in our discussion before we start our discussion um, let me quickly um, have a, a little note to our participants online because later on after those this 45 minute planned discussion we'll have a q a session and in that q a session we will ask questions and ide ideally those questions will come from your end so you will have a question, a text box that is located next to the video screen that you can currently see on the platform that you're logged in. Type in the question that you would like to ask to either the entire panelist here or to a specific panelist and then submit it. Only as a note, you're also allowed to submit more than one question and we are really keen to receiving a lot of them um, and then having an, a fruitful discussion uh, later on. With that, I would like to go now to the panelists that we have and introduce them uh, quickly. To start with, the lady right next to me um, is Petra Laux. She is the acting chief sustainability officer of the Syngenta Group. Next to her is Bad Dar. He is an executive vice president and uh, responsible for the maritime policy and government affairs at MSC. And then Markus Pfanne, who you just heard, the vice president sustainability of Tetra Pak. I would like to ask the first question to Petra, and it, it's a little, maybe a provocative question. Thinking about the business model of Syngenta that has to do with chemicals and chemicals that, that can or will end up in, in the soil, in the ground, and also maybe in, in the food. Is that a business model that can be transformed into a fully sustainable business model at all? Thanks, Benjamin, for the question. You know, that's exactly the question I asked myself before joining the company less than two years ago. And maybe there, there are two perspectives to put. So first, um, what is the big challenge? We saw this in the video already for Marcus. You know, we will be two billion more people that need to be fed within the planetary boundaries within the next um, 20, 30 years. So, so how, do we, how we, do we deal with that challenge and how can we achieve this? If you look at Syngenta, we don't consider us a chemicals uh, company. We are supporting farmers in meeting their challenges. And the last 60 years, we have been helping farmers, you know, to triple the yields while only 13% more land has been used. That's a tremendous achievement of modern agriculture. Now, going forward, the demands are moving, and I believe fundamentally a company can only be profitable, sustainably profitable, if their purpose is in line with societal expectations. And our strategy is now also to help with farmers and go through the next um, decades of, of transformation. If you look at agriculture, agriculture makes uh, roughly 12% of greenhouse gas emissions and the whole food sector, it's 25%. Um, agriculture is responsible for 70% of freshwater use and in the last 40 years, unfortunately, 33% of arable land have been degraded. So there's a lot of change work to do and, and we are developing a plant health strategy and I think there will be more opportunity to, to go into details. We want to accelerate our innovation to get the products and services and the seeds. We are also a seed company, as you said before, to farmers that help dealing with these challenges, that help mitigating climate change, that help restoring soil, that help protecting and enhancing biodiversity because that's what we ultimately lead for this planet. Thank, Thank you, Peter. Another question to, to Bat: How is your company and your and the entire sector affected by the the global drive towards net zero? Well, thanks for the question. Thanks for the chance to be here, and thanks for leading off with such a softball question. Um, it is uh, an enormous challenge. Um, it's an enormous challenge, not only. Uh, for internal reasons, because we want to do the right thing as a company, but as a policy and regulatory challenge, there's no greater challenge. And one of the reasons for that is that in ocean shipping, there's a huge degree of autonomy that's required. We basically have to carry all of our own fuel with us. So imagine if you were going to drive your automobile for, you know, at times 40 days consecutively and carry all of that fuel with you all the time. That's the kind of analogous challenge that we've got, except on a much larger scale. So 
with the limited amount of options that are available today, which for ocean shipping at the moment, today at scale, you basically have energy efficiency, uh, certain types of biofuels, and liquefied natural gas from a fossil source. Um, there is some potential uh, definitely towards decarbonization. We make progress there, and all of these things are part of the mix, and they're going to continue to be part of the mix. But in themselves, or, or those three together, will not get us to, dec to decarbonization. So what we need is a breakthrough in large-scale fuels that we can carry enough of on the ship and still have it you know, make some sort of sense to operate a ship. And that's the real challenge for us, not a willingness to do the right things, not a willingness um, to commit from um, you know, a corporate level, uh, both financially and with deployment of our assets. It is, we can't bring the engines or fuel cells to the market ourselves. That's, that's not what we do, uh, but we'll definitely buy the most innovative ones. But the bigger problem is we don't produce new fuels. Um, those fuels have to be produced by others, and that's the single biggest challenge we face because shipping in its totality currently accounts for about 2 to 3% of the overall anthropogenic uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, that percentage could go up over time, and I don't mean to say that because it's a small amount um, when it comes to the greenhouse gas aspect, but when you think about the fuel consumption, we're too small to drive the energy markets ourselves. So the trick for us is to send the right demand signal, find the right partners and energy providers, and make sure that when those things such as green hydrogen and the derivatives like green ammonia, um, synthetic methanol, synthetic uh, LNG come to the marketplace, we get our share of them and not just conceptually, but through the midstream and actually delivered to the ships when we need it. So, single biggest challenge we face, it is an existential challenge for ocean shipping, but I believe we'll get there, and we have to get there. We can't fail at this. It's not an option to fail. We must succeed. It's a question of how fast can we go. Okay. Maybe taking that also to you, Marcus, is there also, are you dependent in the business model and in the sector and the packaging industry that, that you work in? on let's say an external breakthrough in, in terms of maybe a new technology that comes in or new ideas that, that in forms of materials that you may, may want to use that helps you reaching your um, ambitious goals? Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, you know, I would say the challenge is, is big and complex, right? And in that sense, I think we, we really need to collaborate, first of all but also we really, really need innovation. And, and in both parts, there is partners, there is others needed across the full value chain. Um, so I would say, if you look at Tetra Pak, you know, we, we see that um, it's really clear that, that people understand nowadays the dilemma between the need of greater consumption. We heard about the increasing population. We are heading towards 9 billion by 2050. This will need 70% more food, 70%, while 30% of food today is wasted, right? On the other side, we also acknowledge that packaging, uh, you know, that is delivering this food, um, you know, is also impacting the planet. If you talk about resource use, climate, etc., and here we really need to work holistically across all those elements to make it happen. For example, on climate, to get to net zero, and indeed, if you want to reach that, we need collaboration. If I take Tetra Pak as an example, on the climate uh, roadmap, uh, we are not starting at zero. We want to reach zero, but we have been on 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 a long uh, already. A journey over the last uh, decades, actually. Um, we set ourselves in 2010 the goal of capping the 2010 emissions at that level while growing the business by 2020. And uh, we have now achieved that goal. Um, we have been growing the business and also have been able to decoupling the, the emissions. So in that sense, that was a big step, but this was also a lot driven by our own operation decarbonization. Now going forward, uh, we have the, the uh, target, as you have heard, in the video of net zero uh, by 2050 across the full value chain. Uh, and uh, we are also uh, science-based targets initiative approved, meaning we have a target of minus 46% across the full value chain by 2030. And to reach that, we really need collaboration by, by others because our part of the operations, if you look at the full value chain, is only 3%. 97% is in the value chain. But that doesn't mean that it is not up to us. We decide with whom we work and how we work and what we innovate. So I think to your point, there is collaboration needed with suppliers, with industry partners, with innovators, 
And as well, when, we, when it comes to our packaging solutions innovation, we are also increasingly working together with other companies because, um, yeah, that's, that's what, where we see we can make fast innovation happening uh, better. Okay, so, so at least now I hear being dependent on others and working together with others is, is, is key to achieve those, those goals. Um, Petra, in, in Syngenta, um, what are the areas around sustainability that you focus on and what do you do exactly? So we have uh, three pillars for our sustainability program and which is, which is, by the way, we don't call it sustainability program as such because it's integral to what, to what we do. We would never be successful if it was somewhere a sustainability department, you know, and then somewhere a business department. But um, we have three strands of action. The first is um, accelerate innovation. So you, you opened with saying actually society doesn't want pesticides. And, um, we have actually been, as an industry, successful in the last 60 years to reduce pesticide use by 95% by just bringing newer compounds, which are more effective, need to apply it in less open and are more beneficial in the environment. And we are gonna, gonna drive this journey. So we have innovation criteria, which say reduce respect reward. Reduce actually says we want to reduce the residues and the impact on the environment. Reward means we want to allow farmers profitability and product quality because at the end of the day we have a triple challenge. You know, we need to look at food security, we need to look at environment, and we need to look at farmer livelihood because otherwise farmers can't produce the, the food we need. And we want to um, respect the soil health and the biodiversity. So these are our innovation criteria which we apply to all our pipeline. The second is um, helping farmers mitigate climate change and um, restore biodiversity. So we are developing many seeds that um, need less water. Um, we are developing compounds that help increase nutrient efficiency, which means you need less fertilizer, which is a major reason for climate change emission. We have a corn seed that um, is feed efficient. You can uh, produce dairy and meat by using 5% less feed. And so there are a couple of, of technologies uh, we are supplying to helping farmers actually achieve that objective. And lastly, you know, our own uh, operations, which are, which are minimal. Um, you said it's 3%. I don't have, I don't have the, the number actually for Syngenta, but the impact we have in our own operation is, of course, that's the standard procedure, trying to look for every single product. How can we produce it with less energy, with less footprint? Um, and the issue we face, like everybody, it's, it's not only our own operations, but our upstream suppliers. We need to work with, you know, can we get cleaner, cheaper, better um, source um, ingredients to produce our compounds. So is then Syngenta in a position that um, the company can develop most of that innovation um, itself, or are you also highly dependent on other external parties? When it comes to our own innovation pipeline, we are pretty independent, but of course we consult because one of the key questions is what does good look like, right? You, you want to meet the customer expectation and the society expectation in, in your innovation, but actually we, we drive that process. In the, in the production, we are a lot dependent on those who supply our raw materials. And, and there, your, your point, you know, do you have significant market share? Um, that's where you also need collaboration and where regulation sometimes can help simply to change the standards because alone you're not often, you're not always influential enough. But you're sitting now directly as MSC between Tetra Pak and Syngenta and most likely you're also a service provider to both of them because you carry around and transport their, their material and, and products around the world. Um, being really dependent in, in key um, areas for, for decarbonization on others, what can you do as a company uh, as, let's say, quick wins um, to, to um, start going, which you are already going that decarbonization pathway, which were the quick wins that you could realize at your end? Well, unfortunately, I have to say that the quick wins have probably already been obtained. And if you look at our carbon intensity numbers from 2008, uh, we've achieved nearly 40% on a 2008 baseline on a per unit basis. And that's really reflective of, of doing the things that were easy and doing things that were a bit hard, but not incredibly challenging, uh, such as uh, we, we made modifications to 
our existing ships to put um, new bows on them and new propeller devices on them that increase the energy efficiency, but things that we can still do. Uh, working together with our, our partners, our customers, um, is to improve efficiency in the system, particularly on the shore side component of it. And so relaxing some of the expectation on what speed containers have to be delivered at helps a bit. Also optimizing the voyage and the arrival and departure so that you never end up in a situation where a ship unnecessarily hurries up to get to a port only to wait. Um, that doesn't do anybody any good and it causes um, an exponential increase in the power consumption and uh, the uh, resulting uh, emissions as well from the ship if you have that wasted uh, effort. So I think doing things that we can do to work together, very important in that aspect. Also seeing a demand signal from our customers being willing to help really join with us on this journey financially is very important because it's one thing to talk about it conceptually, but at the end of the day, we're providing a service for trade. We're a conduit for world trade. And if those that need the products to either be delivered or received are not willing to absorb the costs of decarbonization, um, that business is not a long-term viable business model to, to, to be in. So. Um, we ultimately really need to have that realization be there and work on solutions together. And we do have some customers that have shown that willingness and shown the creativity. And I would urge more and more of those to come forward and work together with us as we look for the really hard solutions. Because as I said, the quick wins, we probably already got. What is at MSC the, the driving force behind the sustainability agenda? Basically, why are you doing it? Number one is we're a family company um, and the values in our company very much reflect the values of the family that founded it and still runs it. Um, we're very unique in that regard uh, in shipping and an enterprise this size. And uh, so that's number one and it's what they think is important that we be responsible corporate citizens and do the right things, decarbonization being a piece of that. Number two would be demands from our customers and whether that is um, the needs of our customers on the cargo end, whether they're freight forwarders or the beneficial cargo owners or many of the, the small customers we have, the more this is important to them by definition as a service provider, the more it's important to us and we need to match those expectations so we can be good partners to them as they manage their scope three emissions in their own enterprises. And then the third, and you know, sometimes this is the most important, sometimes it's not the most important, but you can't ignore it, is the external forces from the regulators, which I think reflects the evolving view of society. And it does evolve, and it depends at times on which generation has a year of the policymakers. And so I'm constantly talking about this subject, and as we see, for example, on our cruise side, that although our customers say that they would like to have a sustainable experience, they'd like their cruise line to be sustainable, when you ask them if they'd actually pay a little more for that, they're not really willing to. But that's today, and that is also changing. But if you look at tomorrow, the ships that we took, um, we took one ship this year, another cruise ship coming later in the year, they're gonna be in service 30 or 40 years from now. So the customers that we're gonna be relying upon then are a very different generation of customers than our, our core customers today. Their values are different. They grew up with this being important to them, and their voices can't be ignored. They're really important. We need to listen to that. And if I take that beyond the business to consumer business that Cruise is, they're also gonna be people that are running the businesses that are our customers on the cargo side right now too in the coming years. If we can't adapt to meet those expectations and meet those needs, the regulators certainly will reflect their views and force it on us one way or the other. So it all comes together to be one unifying force where it makes sense to be a long-term viable business. You have to be a sustainable business and you have to have it in your ethos. Marcus, uh, Tetra Park is also family owned. Uh, would you agree to everything Bob just said or would you um, add something or change something? Well, I think it uh, doesn't matter if you know your company is family owned or, or uh, um, on the stock market or, or other uh, structures. I think we all 
we all understand that uh, the world is really facing some major challenges uh, uh, in today's world. And uh, I think everybody has the responsibility to, to try to contribute to that. And, and I think in that sense, um, it is delivering value if you act sustainably, if you bring sustainable innovation to the market, this adds value to, to your customers, to the consumers, but also your employees. And I think in that sense, it, it's certainly uh, you know, a journey that, that uh, we, we are very motivated to execute. It's a uh, renewability and recyclability uh, driven agenda where we um, are on the way towards uh, the most the world's most sustainable package, I think, as you have heard, um, where we want to use only renewable or recycled materials, fully recyclable package, and also have carbon neutrality and carbon neutral packages. And of course, that's, that's a big challenge, right? Uh, because on one side, we need high performance packaging and we need to keep that, the high performance packaging aspects while innovating and really improving all those aspects at the same time. And I think this is a big, big challenge. Uh, at Tetra Pak, we uh, are committed to spending uh, approximately 100 million euro per year in sustainable uh, development and engineering efforts, so sustainable innovation to come out in the next five to 10 years every year. And uh, that is uh, certainly a big commitment. But at the same time, we also need to work uh, across the value chain a lot on recycling, uh, climate uh, uh, as well. And here, of course, you know, legislation plays a key role as well to enabling conditions, a framework where companies can really strive and can invest in a, in a positive way um, and have, have a, an investment security in that sense. When it, when it comes to recycling, I think it's also one of the big challenges, uh, circularity in, in that we are facing. And uh, Tetra Pak cartons are recyclable. They are collected and recycled wherever there is uh, efficient waste management and recycling infrastructure in place. Um, and we have increased the recycling facilities uh, over the last two decades quite a lot. Uh, uh, we came from around 40 in the early 2000s, and now we are at uh, more than 190 uh, recycling facilities worldwide that we have enabled and co-invested in. Um, so also here we are investing you know, above and beyond the regulatory requirements. But having said that, uh, again, all comes down to collaboration and also um, uh, legislative support. I think legislation can help, like also in extended producer responsibility, to really accelerate and, and uh, increase recycling rates. So in that sense, also we, we welcome any uh, support in that direction that can help us as companies um, to succeed across the value chain, that incentives are given to all the players across the value chain. So it's not just uh, you as a company, but also the society legislation that all is going in the same direction. Would you mind just yeah. if I picked up on one point Please. that Marcus made? Because um, you mentioned employees, and, and I didn't. But one of the really kind of unintended positive consequences of communicating more effectively about the things we're doing in sustainability has been the reaction of our employees uh, worldwide. And we knew that there would be a positive element to it, but it, it, it's not what motivated us. We were already doing the things that, that we wanted to talk about. We just weren't as visible as some others in our, our economic space or, or market space are. And as we've started to do that, the response from our employees has been tremendous. I mean, you can just, you can hear the pride, you know, and when I post something on, on, on LinkedIn that, that I've done on behalf of the company, for example, uh, in the public space, the comments that come back from throughout the world in our company really sends a signal that this is important to them. And if you think about what it takes to be a good employer and have a viable long-term business, um, the, the satisfaction of the of, of the employees really matters a lot, particularly as that younger generation of employees become our management and, and eventually leadership of the company in the future. So I think that's a really important point, and I thank Marcus for raising it. Maybe another question, how far away are you from reaching that ultimate goal of having a fully carbon neutral package in terms of years? Do you have an idea or is that still too difficult to say? Yeah, I think uh, a very good question. I think we need to differentiate here between um, the company, a corporate goal like net zero that we are having. We want to be net zero by 2050 as an ambition across the full value chain and net zero by 2030 in our own operations. And this is, of course, a big, big, big uh, uh, journey. But we are on a good way. At the same time, when we talk about carbon neutral packaging on, on a product level, um, that is already happening today. So we are 
using uh, packages, carton packages that are made 70% from, from paper. So as you have heard in the video as well, uh, our, our packaging typically has a lower footprint than alternative packaging like uh, PET, glass bottles and so on. Um, and we're using as well renewable polymers in our package to make it even more low carbon. Um, now, having said that, there's also a possibility to then equalize the remaining little emissions on a product level by doing good uh, climate uh, projects and equalizing that and also bringing already today um, climate neutral or, or carbon neutral packaging or products to the market. But what we, we believe in, and I think is really important here to highlight, is that we are really decarbonizing. And, you know, sometimes um, recycling is, is taken as the go-to solution in the, in the packaging industry. But we cannot just recycle our way out of the climate crisis. The materials itself also have a big impact. And that, that is what we need to work on, on as well. So we are really on a renewal, renewability-driven and recyclability-driven innovation where the materials part needs to be looked at. Uh, if you look at packaging materials, um, if we do nothing by 2050, they will account for approximately one third of uh, global greenhouse gas emissions um, in, in the food industry. So, um, so, so we are playing here a critical role and, and we cannot just look at uh, one part like recycling or climate. We need to look at things in a, in a, holistic, a holistic way and really decarbonize hard ourselves. Oh, thank you, Marcus. Peter, where do you have the most difficulties in your sustainability ambitions? Picking up on a few themes, I think the biggest issue here is the alignment of incentives. And if I think about the targets we are setting for ourselves and um, for farming, because again, the downstream impact of what we can achieve with our products and helping farmers is, is bigger than our own footprint. We have until 2030, we have only eight yields to go, right? Eight harvests um, until we can have to meet our challenges. And um, we could accelerate this probably if the business model for sustainability was better at farm level, because we don't have this full alignment yet between what society wants, what the planet needs, and what the farmer is rewarded for. For, for decades, the farmer has rewarded for yield and quality. And now the challenge is to, to bring a business model at farm that actually rewards common good, carbon sequestration, improving biodiversity. And we are working uh, downstream with the value chain. Um, we are hoping you know, to raise secondary standards, uh, give incentives for farmers to, um, to produce in a regenerative um, way, sequestering carbon in the soil. Um, but it's really, really hard because exactly as you have been saying, but you know, when it comes to the consumer to pay actually more, um, it's not so straightforward as, as you would think. And if you look at um, the increase in turnover in the retail market, also in Switzerland in, in times of COVID, it was actually the cheap product that gained market share, not, not the more expensive one where you would expect they have a better footprint. So we, on the one hand, we try to go via the, the value chain and have alliances. The others, of course, is if you look at how farmers make, make the money and what the business model is, it's a lot of subsidies. And if you look at um, the European Common Agricultural Policy, their efforts to establish 20 to 30 percent of the common agricultural budget and to, to make them available for ecosystem services. I believe that's ultimately the, the right way to go because you can't raise private money for, for financing of common goods. But we are not yet there. So um, since our customers are the farmers, it's, it's still often a hard sell from a, from a pure profitability perspective to suggest a different way of farming or to, to sell products which have a different footprint. Uh, but I also want to say um, farmers are not only driven by profitability, you know, they are very um, connected with their land, they want to do the right thing, but of course you can't leave profitability um, outside of your thinking, even if you are a farmer. So what would be the right le lever to pull to, to get exactly this challenge uh, solved? Is it really, is it via a regulation? Is it um, trying to motivate or to explain um, the, the positive effects to the, the, the final consumer? Do you need to convince 
the, the, the thinking of the farmers yourself. So what is it exactly um, that you should do, that you could do, that would help you and, and everyone else to um, be, become more sustainable? One way is a labeling system. You know, it's happening already in Europe. If you look at Nutri-Score, so we think of a similar approach for regenerative farming or um, planet-conscious uh, production. So the consumer can actively choose what to buy and what to choose. And the other is the restructure of the subsidies to really reward um, the sustainable farming practices. I think that is also similar to um, to, to maybe the ambitions that you have um, around Tetra Pak. So you would also say it helps, it could help um, your ambitions if in the end it is clearly labeled how much carbon um, is, 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 what the carbon footprint of an actual final product is that would then include, of course, the packaging element, the food element, and the, the logistics element. So basically everything along um, the entire cycle until it's then um, in, the, in the stores. Sure, uh, I think I would say that the consumer really plays a critical role here and, and uh, we as an industry, as, as companies, need to enable as well the consumer to take uh, good choices and enable to take choices that are informed. So in that sense, uh, we fully support, uh, you know, labeling on packages. Um, this can be about sourcing, you know, we are having the FSC logo, we are having the Bon Sucre logo that demonstrates that we have a responsible sourcing in place. But as well, um, we have uh, options available, plant-based uh, packaging options with a very high uh, renewable share where we can also communicate to consumers um, the benefit of these cartons. So we are using the Carbon Trust, for example, as an independent certification uh, body where we can then, and the cust our customers to the consumers can communicate the reduction in carbon footprint that is done, for example, when we use renewable polymers on top of the paper content. And we have, we have certifications in place of carbon reduced label. We have in Europe as well the carbon neutral label that we introduced last year. And this is, of course, a great tool to educate consumers, to give them the choice to take better choices and, and to accelerate, create demand for sustainable solutions. And, and we certainly believe that sustainable solutions can make a positive difference also in, in a competitive landscape, that we can really have an advantage and, 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 um, and be recognized uh, in that sense. So, yeah, I think uh, an important role, but having said that, it's not just about the consumers, it's also about ourselves, that we are creating awareness within our, our companies, that we, we have a proactive dialogue with legislation, because also here we, we I think, can benefit from, from the right framework in the different countries. We see, you know, different economies evolving in different ways. Uh, the EU, with the, EU, the European Green Deal by 2050, uh, China is evolving very strongly as well, uh, on the climate side, but also with circularity and recycling initiatives. So in that sense, uh, I think it's all of us that can really contribute there. But could we maybe summarize um, in the meantime, so far the discussion that there is a strong demand from consumers for more sustainable products and services, but at the same time, not really greater pockets and, and uh, willingness to pay more for the same products and services. Yeah, I think it, at present, that's probably the state of things. But I think if the consumer um, thought about what the impact would be on the per consumer unit of goods, they probably would be amenable to paying a premium for that. So I think they need to be educated on that. Our bigger challenge is on the cargo side of our business, those aren't our direct customers. Our customers are actually larger scale um, shippers that, that have large volumes. And, and they see much, much bigger numbers. They need to hear the demand signal to actually build that premium in and work with us on it. But I, I think your summary is about right. Okay. But you know, if I can just maybe add on uh, here uh, in terms of willingness to pay extra and appreciate sustainable products, um, we at Tetra Pak do as well a lot of researches. Uh, uh, we do big environmental research with consumers every second year where clearly it is indicated that consumers are increasingly willing to pay actually extra. Um, and we also do um, what we call the Tetra Pak Index, uh, which is a global uh, study that, that uh, brings insights into opportunities and trends in the food and beverage industry, where um, until 2019, environment has been actually the number one consumer concern. Then in the pandemic, uh, of course, COVID-19, the pandemic has replaced environment as the number one concern, but uh, environment remains on number two 
uh, with a big, big, big uh, uh, focus, even ahead of economic issues. So I think the consumer sentiment, uh, we you know, recognize uh, um, the planetary boundaries that we are exceeding and that we need to take action. And we need to take action fast. So I think there is an increasing opportunity there. Okay. I mean, one option to change the behavior of a consumer is if he doesn't want to change himself, you force him to change. And that has to do then usually with regulations. I mean, talking about also a little the topic of today, regulations that are around. Um, do regulations in general rather support or hinder sustainable developments? Petra, maybe a question to you first. The most prominent example currently in Europe is the European farm to fork strategy. So what we like about the farm to fork strategy is that it's um, an end to end strategy. It really goes from the farmer to the, to the end consumer. Um, we also like the vision. Um, we don't agree actually with the, with the tools and the proposals that the commission has been making on how to achieve the goals because they are still prescribing uh, agronomic practices or reduction targets that are not suitable to achieve the outcomes we desire. So if we think of outcomes, you know, we believe we need to increase um, carbon in soil, we need to uh, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, we want to increase biodiversity, reduce water use, and we want to maintain yields because yield means also we don't lead, we, we need less land. Uh, otherwise, it's a, it's a circular which uses here. Yeah. So the Commission is instead proposing to reduce inputs to reduce the use of pesticides. So we believe we want to reduce the impact of pesticides, but we want to maintain the yields. And so we have a fundamental disagreement on what is the right methodology. If we were all to agree on the outcome, so what is actually the end goal we want to achieve, um, this would actually foster innovation and this would allow everybody to experiment and try to achieve the goals with with the with the better tools and that's what um, innovation is about and since we talked so much about price right i also believe part of the innovation also will be to make things cheaper not everything that is sustainable must be more expensive i mean europe is a little leading at the moment at least it seems um, to be uh, the the regulatory way um, and try so has certainly has the the ambition to to be number one around the, the, the entire sustainability um, agenda. How do you see, uh, from a transportation sector point of view, um, the European Green Deal? It, it's a bit of a mixed opinion for me. Um, we definitely support the principles and the ideals behind it, and uh, certainly we need to decarbonize, and I think Europe is greatly positioned, uh, and, and when I say Europe, I mean those outside the EU, located geographically uh, here as well, of course, um, have, have a unique opportunity to really become leaders in technology, uh, particularly in the maritime space. I, I think there's great opportunity for that if the right focus is there and government catalyzes the right things to happen. And I think there are some good roles for government. The reason I say my response is a little mixed is there is a balance when you're talking about regulating a global industry, and I don't think you will find a more global industry than ocean shipping. We operate in our network in 155 countries around, around the world. There's a port somewhere we probably you know, have ships there from time to time, if not every day. Um, if you go too far with unilateral regulations, as opposed to showing leadership in international regulation, you can really distort the regulatory environment and maybe break it. Uh, because if there's retaliation taken, because maybe something like um, a, a, let's just call it a tax on carbon, is imposed on a unilateral basis in Europe, and it's on both inbound and outbound trade, um, wouldn't you expect other countries to retaliate? Um, they're going to see it as just a trade on tax, uh, sorry, a tax on trade. And so um, you need to find the right balance, the right tipping point about being a leader and using your power as a block at UN organizations such as the International Maritime Organization, which, which regulates shipping, to build upon what's already been done and take it in the right direction, not take it over and turn what would be better as a global set of regulations into something that instead is limited to the European space. So I think that's the fine line 
that has to be walked here and it can be walked. And you know, keep in mind, shipping had global regulations in place on greenhouse gas reduction that were effective as of 2013 on a mandatory basis worldwide. I don't know of any other global sector that's been regulated that way. And they have incrementally been changed almost continuously and, and are undergoing some, some pretty radical transformation now to make it even more aggressive and more successful. And I think Europe um, can not only play a role within the continent, but also in helping to influence those global regulations to complement what they're doing on a localized basis. And I think that's the best formula overall. How do you see the role of, of specifically Asia and, and also China and that sustainability, let's say, raised to, to net zero um, um, at the moment and maybe in the, in the near future? So rather uh, taking on a leading role or at the moment still waiting a little at the sidelines? How do you perceive it? China is complicated in almost every aspect. If, if, if you've done a lot of business here, and our business does rely very heavily on, on trade in and out of China, their public pronouncements about net zero by 2060 got a huge amount of attention, rightfully so. I mean, I think it, it, it really marked a watershed in the way that their leadership spoke about decarbonization as being a value to their society. Now, I think what remains to be seen is, you know, can they really live into that? Because uh, the challenges there are extremely difficult um, for them to overcome. Um, but they are willing, as they have in other areas, such as um, electronics or uh, production of large-scale consumer goods or shipbuilding or, 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 the list is really long, to show a high level of enthusiasm to invest and in, in those industries and cultivate them. And I think they're doing the same with regard to decarbonization technologies. And so I think if Europe in particular, but also the same could be said uh, for the US or perhaps Brazil, uh, that are also very capable countries of, of stepping up into this space, if they don't actually take their rightful place in being innovators and technology providers, I think you can rest assured the Chinese are going to duplicate the kind of success that they've had in other industrial spaces where it's been a national priority. And now that they've made decarbonization a national priority, I would look for them to, to start delivering on what they said they were going to do. But locally, the challenges are, are really significant for them. But I, I, if I could just go on for one more moment. There is a marked change in the international negotiations that happen around shipping regulation with regard to China. Um, it was almost unthinkable about five or six years ago that you could have heard the Chinese delegation make interventions that were supportive of increasing the level of regulation and increasing the rate of decarbonization of shipping because their national interests were kind of focused otherwise. We see their diplomatic face on this being dramatically different today than it was even that short time ago. So. Um, I'd look for them to, to stay in the policy space and stay in the technology space. And if you don't work at it, there's no way you will catch up with them because they're extraordinarily thoughtful and extraordinarily capable. Marcus, how do you sense the, 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 the relevance of sustainability and the behavior of consumers in Asia? Do you sense that this is a little different to what we have here in Europe or is it maybe fundamentally different at the moment? Yeah. Thanks, uh, Benjamin. Good question. Um, I think some things are the same and some, some things uh, certainly are different. Um, if I get back to the um, comments before on the uh, farm to fork uh, policy in, in Europe, uh, that is something certainly also we are strongly supporting. Um, the goal here is to uh, cut uh, food waste by 50% by 2030. And, and uh, we as Tetra Pak uh, think we can really contribute there with our high performance processing and, and packaging solutions. So that's something um, I'm saying because also it is about integrated policy, right? That integrates different aspects. It's not in silos, climate, circularity, uh, food, but really looks at the whole thing in an integrated way. And I think uh, the farm to fork strategy is a good example of that. Now, uh, also the other parts, if you talk about uh, climate and uh, circularity are important and they, those are major major parts in the uh, European uh, way forward, but also in China and in Asia, right? If you look at Asia, certainly in China, 
um, the climate uh, uh, target and the climate ambition plays a very significant role. It's really prominent in all the discussions right now. The roadmap is shaped, it's being shaped right now towards the future. Um, but as well in the rest of Asia, um, the climate is not that of a hot topic. I think there there is more sentiment about uh, waste, waste in the environment, pollution and so on. So there is differences. And I think also um, in, in, in Asia, you know, um, there is a lot of, of uh, problems that are specific to the countries, right? With growing population, urbanization, uh, um, income disparity, education and so on. On top of it, now the COVID-19 situation with a lot of economic challenges. So I think the governments have really to balance uh, uh, what they can do short term, mid term, long term. But certainly um, sustainability plays a key role. And uh, practically, I can just take the example of EPR, Extended Producer Responsibility Policy. That is not only expanding in Europe, but also in Asia very much. Um, voluntary schemes or mandatory schemes. If we take China as an example, in China, uh, carton packages are part of a pilot project on EPR where we are um, going towards a 40% recycling rate in 2025. Today we are uh, slightly above 20% and that certainly helps. So if we have regulation that looks at, uh, at it in a holistic perspective, um, sets clear, ambitious, but yet reachable targets, uh, the industry I think can really invest and develop in a positive way. Um, and I think we see uh, uh, in Europe, but as well in China really, a positive developments in that direction that, that we certainly uh, support. EPR has proven to be successful to increase recycling rates where it is applied. And we have been and will continue to be a committed partner to develop and also to implement EPR system where it exists. Thank you. Petra, for Syngenta, how heavily influencing are the current and maybe expected regulations in, in Europe and in Asia for the investment decisions that you make? I think they are they're massively influencing our investment decisions. Um, because as we said before, right, we want to make um, a sustainable long-term strategy with, which is based on sustainability. Our, our investment of two billion into um, sustainable products that deliver environmental breakthroughs is supposed to lead to a 10 billion flow of revenue over, over time. So that's more or less the, the equation we are looking at. Um, if you look at government regulation as it um, occurs directly to us, it's of course the pesticide legislation. And um, this is, um, while it's fastest in Europe, it's occurring everywhere globally. Um, the, what is, by the way, often overseen is that our products, as they are today, they are regulated to do no harm. So if you use our products uh, according to the label and to the instructions, you should have no um, uh, harming effect. And our food, both in Europe as and elsewhere, is actually safe. What you still find in terms of residues is so far below the maximum residue levels that this is not a problem. It's more, more the perception, but the perception drives regulation. And that's why, because it's our license to operate, we are massively impacted by the regulation and, and what we can sell and how we invest. Mm -hmm. Is the current state of regulations in Europe, Asia, and also let's also include uh, the United States, is that as in a state that is rather hindering you from invest from, from making investments, or is that a, a current situ situation that is for you stable enough and, and sustainable enough that, that you can continue to, to invest, or are you waiting um, for, for a new setup to, to, um, to kick in to then um, unleash your investments? So for us, the biggest um, question is the innovation cycle. Um, it takes you know, 10, 11 years from research to getting a product on the market. So we are selling today what we conceived um, a decade ago. And something we would really like to see in Europe as well is an acceleration of the innovation cycle by speeding up and, and um, modeling new legislation that um, allows safe products. And one way we're looking at, at Europe is we are looking at uh, biological crop protection and we believe this is where the European Union could could actually give innovation a stimulus by allowing a separate market access pathway. 
Thank you, Petra. And also, Bart and, and, and Marcus, time flies. Um, so the official 45 minutes for our discussion um, are over, but we have hopefully received, and I see already the first question from the virtual audience, and uh, I'll read it out loud, and then we see to whom it, it will be addressed. So the first question that I see here on the screen is, what was the biggest mistake you have experienced on your sustainability journey? What was the biggest learning out of this mistake? I leave it up to you who wants to take this first. Maybe one or two could answer, could have an answer to it. But yes. I'll go first. Uh, I don't think I can really project it onto my company's experience, but rather the experience that I've had with the maritime sector and the work that I do through a variety of trade associations you know, that span the range of our business uh, because we have a lot of different ship types that we operate. And I would say that it was a big mistake that we were not earlier and much clearer about what we stood for, what we could do, and what the limitations were towards meeting the higher aspirational goals of other outside, others outside the sector that would just you know, throw something against the wall and see if it would stick. And I think it was a big mistake. And honestly, I think we've been back on our heels ever since, and in part, um, that was driven by a lowest common denominator of ship owners who really weren't forward thinking, although it was a small number, and held back everyone else and put enough doubt in their mind. The biggest learning I took out of that was if, if I could hit the rewind button and start all over again, if I was in a position to do it, as, as I definitely am today, I would insist that those associations go out and they tell the story. They tell the societal benefit in, in clear terms that's provided by shipping. Because, you know, until the ever given incident in the Suez Canal here you know, recently, a lot of people never gave any thought to, hey, 12% of the trade goes through that canal and 90% of, of, of goods uh, travel on, on ships. Um, we haven't done a good job of explaining that. And then once you do that, you have a better baseline for saying, you know, we want to do the right things here. Here's what we can do right now. Here's what we want to do in the future. And here's the kind of partners we're going to need to work with us to get there to that end state. And I think we would have been in a more collaborative posture than we find ourselves in today, which, um, you know, at times feels, um, you know, much more hostile than it needs to be because we all want the same thing. We all want to decarbonize. And I know in the shipping sector, we want to do it as soon as it's feasible for us to do it. We just need the tools to come to the marketplace to allow for it. We could have done a better job at laying the groundwork for that as an industry. Other mistake experiences? Well, uh, I would just like to pick up on, on what was said here because I think, uh, um, you know, time very much resonates with, with me here that, that uh, was now mentioned. I think time is the critical element. Uh, uh, the faster, the better. And uh, yeah, uh, you know, um, we are really accelerating a lot, we as a company, but also as a sector and, and, and uh, together with legislation, as you talked about it before. But, um, you know, there is still a lack of, I think, drive across all industries and sectors that, that just, I think, needs to be faster and, and, and higher. Um, and this is really a, a call for action in a way. Uh, we, we have a lot of discussions with many stakeholders across the value chain with our suppliers, with recycling partners, as I said before. And, um, you know, I recently ha heard a statement that we are the first generation that cannot say anymore we didn't know. We, we know it. We know what science tells us, what is happening in a, in a couple of years and decades. And I think there's just a big realization that needs to happen to, to pull, you know, in the same direction, all of us together um, and, and not lose time. And I think we all probably feel one way or the other that we could have done this earlier, that earlier, where we would be now. Uh, already further uh, and for those that have not yet started and, and gone there we really need you know your help uh, because uh, only as we have heard through the full value chain we can make the, the impact that we need we cannot reach net zero you know on ourselves we need all sectors all companies legislators people consumers together so i think in that sense there's no time time to lose uh, we need to act now and maybe let me let me give this a different facet, but it's essentially the same theme. So one of the biggest mistakes companies do, and um, I've seen this in my previous um, employers, is actually to believe we know better. 
because we are the experts. And I talked before, you know, there's a misperception about the safety of pesticides. Yes, we know they're regulated, they are safe uh, if you use them properly. But we cannot wait and, you know, hope that society will love pesticides one day. That, that will not happen. So this, um, this theme that only if they knew what it was, they would understand and like it, that, that often hinders actually change. And, I admire my predecessor. She um, actually initiated in Zingente a huge listening exercise where the whole company leadership was mandated to talk to stakeholders, the various stakeholders globally. And this helped really drive the change in Zingente and in the strategy to understand we have to work with stakeholder expectations. We cannot believe that we can work against them. Thank you. I see another question coming up directed towards Tetra Pak. So Tetra Paks normally have inside a foil. Is this foil also sustainable? And what are the thoughts of foil recycling after usage of the Tetra Pak? Yeah, thanks for, thanks for this question. So indeed, when you look at our uh, aseptic packaging solutions that enable a long shelf life of products, uh, you know, six to 12 months, depending on the product type, uh, we use on the inside indeed an aluminum foil that protects the product, right, and makes this uh, possible. At the same time, this, this aluminum foil has actually a big impact in terms of carbon. So um, although it's only a very, very thin layer on the inside, the carbon impact on a full package level is actually quite significant. And that is also why we are innovating. As I said before, we are, toward, we are moving towards a package with an increased paper-based content, decreased a polymer and aluminum uh, content where we are having taken the first steps to, to, to eradicate also the aluminum foil in our aseptic package. We have last year uh, now uh, launched the first uh, aseptic package without an aluminum foil uh, in Japan. Uh, it's a first step, there will be more coming, but certainly removing this aluminum foil helps to reduce especially the carbon footprint of the package. So it's part of our development journey. It's a big challenge because again, this foil uh, is there to protect the product, but we are innovating. We are working also with other partners to find alternative barriers. Again, trying to keep the uh, high performance of the package, the functionality, but making it environmentally friendlier. And having said that, you also here ask about the uh, after use uh, of, of, of the package when it is being recycled. Here also, um, it depends a bit on the region. In some regions, you have uh, the full package recycling happening where the Package components, fiber, polymers, aluminum are taken together into new products that are used, for example, for buildings like panels, uh, roof tiles or, or building panels. In other regions, like in Europe, we are also advancing with new recycling uh, uh, methods and technologies to actually separate the materials, fibers, polymers, aluminum, and then have also applications dedicated for that. So I think it depends a bit on the region, but we try to find better outcome of these recycled materials that also enable a better after use. So the recycling value of those materials is higher. Okay. Next question reads, the supply chain is an essential part of the holistic approach. What criteria or standards are the evaluation of suppliers based on? Is it based on a platform or a proprietary solution? That may be a read twice question, so I'll just read it again. The supply chain is an essential part of the holistic approach. What criteria or standards are the evaluation of suppliers based on? Is it based on a platform or a proprietary solution? So how do you assess basically use of suppliers? How do you monitor them? Do you use a standard of something you developed yourself? Maybe if I just uh, try to start answering here. Um, yeah, the supply chain indeed is a very critical uh, element here. And I think it's a combination. You know, it's about uh, standards that you set as a company uh, where we have our code of conduct and other requirements that we put to our suppliers, but it's also about uh, uh, transparent platforms uh, like SEDEX, like CDP uh, and other certifications that can be, can be used to put requirements to suppliers. Uh, if I take Tetra Pak, um, you know, and I take the example of CDP, which is a transparent uh, non a profit organization that, that makes visible the sustainability efforts of a company. Uh, Tetra Pak has been on the A-list uh, uh, for a couple of years now 
uh, in a row, uh, A-list for forests and A-list for, for climate. And that is something you can ask your suppliers to fulfill as well. We had last year, in the end of last year, a big campaign ongoing, uh, also towards 2030, where we're activating all our suppliers. We have meetings, we put our expectations to them, partially referring again uh, to our expectations to them, but then also linking them to CDP and other requirements that are going beyond uh, a Tetra Pak's uh, wishes in that sense. I think we all recognize that it's not just a company that asks for support, but a society. Uh, so it's not just company wishes, but really uh, demands. And they are reflected as well increasingly in standards that can be applied by companies. Yeah, I might say that, um, you know, I don't think that we have a supplier is probably on the scale that, that Marcus does, but we are a significant consumer of of a variety of, of things that do get supplied to us. And our approach is relatively similar at its heart. We have a, a supplier code of conduct, uh, which we put into the agreements uh, for our, our suppliers and they have to live into that. And that has elements of, of uh, business ethics, um, uh, labor requirements, environmental requirements, and things like that. And uh, we in insist on that and then we can enforce it through the contract remedies that are available. And, and we draw from, outside sources in that, of course, um, you know, the SDGs on a high level, but also things like the UK Modern Slavery Act, for example, um, in addition to uh, work that we do in the anti-corruption space, uh, which gives us some material to draw from and incorporate into those agreements. And maybe if I can just add here further on this topic, I think it's also important that actually these standards are translated and communicated to the consumers because also again then they can take conscious decisions uh, we are as i mentioned before are sourcing renewable polymers and we introduced first in the industry the bon sucro certification um, which is a chain of custody certification of, of sustainability that you can also put on pack on the lo a logo on the package that also consumers actually recognize and know that companies are sourcing in the right way so i think also that this transparency it's not just for you as a company, but also transmitted to your customers and their customers. That, that's really important as well. And um, it's, it's very similar in Syngenta. So we have all the um, supplier requirements, like you said. It goes from Essex and anti boy and, and Fair Labour and all of that. The one thing where it's specific is we have... Um, we are a highly regulated industry and we sometimes have requirements that the suppliers and the chemicals need to meet certain standards, which are also in a way platform based. But this is where we have special requests sometimes to get a raw material of a certain quality. And or if we have a certain um, process that needs particular attention, we are also occasionally working with suppliers to see can we induce and help getting some process improvements. But, but mainly, it's, I would say, it's platform-based. Okay. Towards you, Marcus, um, what is your experience internal and external with the Sargas Science-Based Targets Initiative? Yeah, thanks for that question. And that's really, I would say, a big thanks for this question because I think we see the Science-Based Targets Initiative as really a, a guiding star, I think, for companies uh, like us. Um, again, back to science, we know that we can rely on that and we want to act science-based, fact-based and the science-based targets, I think, is a way to guide companies of what they need to achieve by when. So it gives us as companies, I think, the confidence that we are doing the right thing, we can communicate accordingly and that is really great. The science-based target initiative is mostly on the climate, so, as I said, uh, we have a minus 46% across the full value chain, scope 1, 2 and 3, as per the Science-Based Target Initiative by 2030. Um, Science-Based Targets Initiative, I think, is also growing importance in the area of biodiversity. I think where we are lacking uh, a little bit of scientific uh, understanding and there is a lot of efforts ongoing to also uh, uh, evaluate and develop standards on that. Um, so, we are looking forward to actually have more science-based targets. Another question to Bud. Um, do you offer green shipments, meaning the same distance and destination, but a lower footprint, footprint and then in brackets, and a higher price? Question mark. 
I, I have to reframe my answer a little bit. It's not going to match up exactly um, with this, but um, the short answer is yes. Uh, we do offer um, a, um, a, a carbon, neutral, carbon neutrality program for our customers. And what we do is we provide, you know, whether you want to offset your carbon or not, um, we uh, allow the customer or the public even direct access to uh, a website calculator where they can accurately through an approved audited third-party methodology um, estimate the carbon footprint of the shipment that they're planning to make. Then we offer um, through an arrangement that we have with a, a trusted provider um, offsetting for the customer should they decide to use that offsetting mechanism. We haven't yet cracked the nut of how we could do that for a particular shipment. Because if you think about the way we ship, um, you know, we might have 12,000 different containers uh, on, on one ship. And so your, your particular container being transported in a certain way, uh, because it's bundled together with so many other containers, is a hard thing to do. So what we're able to do is, you know, offer the opportunity to um, look at how to accommodate that in another way. So for example, we just had one large customer come forward and say that they wanted uh, to specifically work with us on biofuels. Could we ensure that we provided uh, biofuel blends to a level of their choosing and a volume of their choosing on the trade route that most of their goods are on, or at least a, a, a good chunk of them? And we created a bespoke program to be able to do that for them. And I anticipate we'll do more and more of that as the customers come forward. We're also working uh, on ways that we could bundle together um, the ability to have an off-the-shelf offering for those customers that are willing to pay a premium um, to have something like, you know, biofuel is, is the one readily available option right now, but there certainly can be others in the future uh, if they're willing to do that. And, and again, we have ways that we can certify that and, and verify that, and part of it is um, self-research that we make available through a tool that, that we've developed. Broader question, what, do the panel, what would the panelists recommend to the Swiss government that Switzerland will become a leading country without losing competitive advantage against foreign countries? Difficult one, I don't want to point fingers onto someone, but uh, feel free. Um, <laughs> as an American who's lucky enough to be living in Switzerland at the moment, uh, as a resident, and uh, uh, hopefully I'll be invited to stay much longer. It's a, it's a... <laughs> Uh, it's a, a fantastic experience being here, and I think Switzerland has um, culturally and um, otherwise all of the elements it takes to be a leader in so many different regards. And I think not only in climate change, in the way of technology and cultivating the right things to happen around that so that they can be a leader there as they have been in so many other technology spaces, but also with sustainability um, in general, and encouraging um, that type of behavior um, among the corporate citizens overall, but do so in a way that's pragmatic and, and take into account um, the limitations around that and, and work with the industry to find solutions. Because you know, companies like those that would be represented at an event like this, we want to do the right things and we'll be willing to be leaders on it. Um, so I would just urge collaboration in trying to find those pathways. But I think all the basic components are here in Switzerland, including the ability to invest in a way um, that many countries will never have the opportunity to do to cultivate the right things to happen in the way of um, uh, carbon reduction, uh, alternative fuels uh, development and delivery, um, and also uh, how those pieces come together in digitalized platforms. Yeah, maybe from my side, uh I think the question comes also very timely because I think at the moment the ongoing consultations that are going on in Switzerland on um, the environmental law are a fundamental step in the right direction and uh, we are quite hopeful in many ways. Uh, I think Switzerland has the opportunity to indeed uh, uh, advance and, 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 and take a leading step uh, and, and a leading role here. Now having said that, uh, I think the agenda is pretty uh, uh, wide and is dynamic. Um, if we zoom in on packaging, <laughs> to relate to Tetra Pak again, maybe, um, you know, zoomed in uh, for packaging in Switzerland, um, only glass, uh, uh, metal and uh, PET 
are, are benefiting from a circular uh, stream and carton packages, uh, paper-based packages among also um, compostable materials um, are actually mostly incinerated. So the recycling rate is really uh, far below what we would love to have and, and what we think you know, is good for a truly circular economy. So in this sense, uh, uh, certainly we would very much welcome um, an EPR system that includes all packaging, uh, including as well cartons. And uh, I think we are very hopeful that um, that can happen. And I think this would be a good step for us as an industry. We are committed to, to contribute. Um, we have done some uh, uh, pilots as well um, last year and the year before on making EPR happening in the country with certain retailers as a pilot. We know it can work, but certainly uh, legislation can help us there and we, we uh, would, would hope for that. Thank you. Maybe in terms of timing, um, maybe, Petra, I don't know, do you yeah, want to respond to the thought. question? Switzerland has become so great because it's an innovation powerhouse, right? It has always been focused on facts and science. And our plea would actually be keep that, keep that pathway when it comes to agriculture and plant protection. We unfortunately see that some of these principles are no longer adhered to. And if we, if we want to go to a greener economy, if we want to master the planetary boundaries, we need innovation and new technologies. So my plea to the Swiss government, make sure that this can happen by keeping a science and fact-based regulation. Thank you. And I think that was also a good closing remark for today's um, discussion. So it was really a pleasure having you all here on the panel to, to share a little your, your views and your insights, experiences um, with uh, the, the virtual audience that we, that we have. Um, yeah, with that, uh, we're, we're, coming, we're coming to an end. And um, yeah, maybe also to, uh, to put a, a phrase that Barack Obama once said, and a little aligned with what you mentioned, Marcus, before. We are the first generation to, to actually feel and experience the, the, the negative impact of climate change. Fortunately, we're the last generation who can do something about it. And I think we should. Um, so with that, thank you for attending. And uh, one remark uh, that I wanted to make, um, have uh, an open eye onto the actual physical event of the Europa Forum in Lucerne, which take place on the 24th and 25th of November this year. Uh, and already blocked that date uh, in your calendars and hope to see many of you also there than physically in person. Thank you for attending. Thank you to all the panelists for being here.